Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Boston University and Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. My name is David Chard. I'm the interim dean and professor of special education at uh, Wheelock College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, we're particularly, um, I want to make a comment ab um, about everyone's health and safety, and we hope that in this very challenging time, you're all doing as well as can be expected. Um, as we near the beginning of the school year, typically we would all be uh, furiously preparing classrooms and getting ready for um, welcoming students back to school. And across the United States, different things are happening in different places. And the purpose of today's um, conversation is to really focus on some of the fundamental, what we think are foundational things that um, schools, uh, school leaders and um, teachers might be thinking about and to try to provide a little bit of um, support in that direction. And I'm honored to um, welcome today uh, Jonah Edelman, a friend and colleague who is the CEO and uh, um, founding director of um, Stand for Children, and I'll ask Jonah to talk a little bit more about his organization in a moment. But um, I received, as a, a fan of Stand, uh, Stand for Children and the work they do, I received the document that many of you have received on how to prevent a lost school year. Um, and we have made sure that that was in your registration information, and you should have been reminded of it again when uh, you are confirmed for registration today. If someone does not have that, let me know that in the Q&A and I'll post a, uh, a link to it so that those of you who don't have the link have it now. But our purpose today is not to discuss um, whether or not we should open school in the fall. I think um, we are going to have school in some way, shape or form, whether it's hybrid, remote or in person. And we wanna talk about these things that um, we think are really important to consider as we think about what the nature of this school year is going to look like. So let me begin by introducing you to Jonah and asking Jonah to say a little bit about Stand for Children. Uh, Jonah has been uh, at the policy and advocacy work um, for more than 20 years. And I think um, many of you probably know his work, but I'll ask him to talk a little bit about what Stand for Children is and, and what they what they focus on. Jonah? Thank you, David. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, briefly, Stand for Children is an education advocacy organization. We focus on um, passing policies at the state and district level um, that help more children and young people succeed. Um, we're also very focused on the implement, implementation of those policies because you can secure a, a policy or an investment, but that doesn't mean that kids are actually going to benefit. Um, and in the implementation uh, realm, um, we've obviously um, gotten into a lot of the same um, issues that many of you uh, grapple with daily, um, those of you who run school systems or schools or working in schools. And um, by the way, greatly commend you um, and thank you for that work. Uh, in the context of the pandemic, uh, we were struck that um, much of the guidance that we saw, and there's been just wonderful efforts on the part of many groups to help provide guidance um, to educators who are, you know, in a very difficult situation. Um, but we saw a gap in that um, not a lot of it focused on engaging, motivating, and supporting students. Um, it was more about the questions that David referred to before that we're not going to get into um, in terms of, you know, opening school or not, or how to do it safely, um, and also partnering with families. And we see those as really um, very, very important, not, um, you know, secondary or tertiary uh, to the ability to make the best out of a very challenging situation. Um, so that's where the Preventing a Lost School Year Guide came from. Um, and, you know, as is our want, um, we are focused on uh, evidence. Um, we're focused on, you know, what works in practice, what has actually worked. Uh, and so not just what a, you know, one researcher or think tank has said, but also you know, the experience of educators with, with whom we partner and whom we greatly, greatly respect. Um, and we also are mindful that people are busy um, and that they don't have time to read, you know, really, really long reports. And so um, if you've taken a look, you'll note that the format is such that it's um, focused on not only practices that are achievable uh, and doable uh, and impactful, but also uh, we try to keep it brief <laughs> and try to provide actionable guidance. Yeah, so, uh... 
Jonah, thanks for being with us. And let me um, remind participants that this is being recorded um, and you will receive a link to the recording in the coming days. Um, and then let, let, uh, let me also remind you that at the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A button. You can um, submit questions. And I have a few that I'd like to get us started with that I wanna um, have a conversation with Jonah. We've, we've purposefully not had this conversation already so that it can be authentic. I have some questions about, um, uh, about Stan's um, effort here, but I would really love it if you all could um, chime in with questions that you have that we might be able to respond to. Um, so let me start, Jonah, by um, asking uh, what you, you've already said sort of what motivated you, but what, what was Stan seeing happening in the field that sort of got you all to say, hmm, I wonder if we couldn't put together a tool that would be helpful to schools? Well, first we saw, I mean, we have um, thousands of um, families with whom we work in many cities, and we saw a lot of um, basic needs uh, not being met. Um, you know, heart-wrenching choices that families were having to make. And from an educational perspective, a lot of confusion, lack of information, and inequity with respect to the lack of connected devices. Um, so, you know, that obviously was part of the motivation, um, as well as, you know, noting from trying to read everything we could get our hands on, um, the thrust of much of the guidance um, and the, the, the gap there with respect to you know, motivating, engaging, and supporting students. I also say that as a dad of uh, then ninth graders, now, you know, going to be 10th graders, I saw a lot of the same things in my own household. Um, and so this was not an extrapolation of my, um, you know, own experience solely, but I will say that um, it certainly um, is consistent with what I directly experienced last spring. Mm -hmm. So, I have spent some time looking at the document and digging into some of the specific um, links. And if our participants haven't looked at the links, um, I'm going to encourage you, perhaps not now, but at some point to really dive into some of the links. But I wanna ask you, um, so you've, you've sort of divided this document up into two pieces. One is how to keep students motivated, right? And the other is about how to communicate with families. and. Um, I'm wondering about that, you know, why those two particular focal areas, and then I want to jump into some specifics, but why, yeah, I mean, why those two areas? Yeah, I mean, those, those are areas that we feel like um, we have significant um, direct exper experience with, um, and that they're often, um, unfortunately, given short shrift. Um, they really, you know, are front and center, and I think um, without getting into a whole commentary around you know, broad trends in education. I think we can all agree that uh, the level to which students are motivated, are engaged, and are supported um, is a key determinant of what's going to happen uh, in terms of that student's uh, development and um, progress and or the lack thereof. And so, and similarly with families, um, you know, I think there's a lot of great work, including in um, Dallas, where you were before, uh, David, my colleague uh, Stacy Hodge, um, has uh, uh, you know done excellent work with the Home Visit Project there, and uh, there's there's definitely um, a greater and greater, I believe, recognition of the benefit of connecting uh, educators with families in partnership, um, as opposed to the notion of you know just get out of our way, uh, we'll take care of it. Um, it's sort of logical and obvious, but um, I think you know traditions and um, culture is strong. Um, and so, you know, again, we just see these as being really important and uh, having been uh, fairly um, uh, unaddressed in the guidance related to the pandemic school year ahead. I would say this, David, that, um, you know, the, the, the suggestions I'm sure that the audience would agree are relevant to any school year. Um, but I think it's particularly important when you have students learning remotely, um, mm -hmm. that you go out of your way to ensure that students stay um, engaged and motivated. It's very hard, you know, in general, and, and sometimes to, you know, quote unquote, motivate and engage a, a teenager um, in, um, or have as much um, history of success, and, uh, or they might have as little less inherent interest. But then when they're not proximate, there isn't the ability to connect and really 
uh, maintain a strong relationship, it's even harder. Right. And so then, you know, it goes to things like, um, what are your grading practices um, in that respect um, on the student side? Um, you know, do your grading practices motivate students who may be more academically um, oriented to do their absolute best um, as opposed to last spring? And I can tell you, I saw this firsthand. Um, I bet a lot of parents would agree. They saw their kids, you know, do the minimum. Um, you know, and, but even more importantly, perhaps, you know, in terms of kids who may struggle, what is our goal? Um, with grades is our goal to, um, you know, just differentiate in some sort of, um, you know, coldly calculating way, or is it really to foster success, um, you know, on the part of students, help students actually learn uh, lessons and um, develop strengths that will serve them well in life. And so that is an underpinning of the notion of, you know, really uh, uh, focusing on uh, a development, developmental approach to student uh, grades where, you know, you're encouraging students to make up assignments, you're enabling students to uh, retake tests, you're giving students the opportunity through hard work and through improvement and taking feedback um, to do better. That's just one example. Um, uh, but, you know, in terms of those two categories, it really goes back to, you know, where we felt like there was an opportunity to help um, schools, districts do better and where the guidance was lacking. Yeah. So you've talked about two very specific things that I want to, um, I want to ask a little more on, um, and then uh, I have a, some, some opinions of my own about this. But but let me let me begin about um, the relationship building piece. And you all described it as communication with families and the importance of over communicating in a time of crisis. And um, you know we've struggled, I think, as a field, even um, in our best of times, communicating with parents um, and building that relationship. Tell, tell me what you think about the availability of technology today to change, you know, you describe virtual um, home visits. Um, are people using these across the country? Is Stand advocating for this? Are, do you see some places where this is happening? And, and perhaps um, members of the audience have examples they can share as well that, um, and, and what is that, what, what's, how does that change the relationship for families when you're in their home? Uh, at, at least through Zoom or some some sort of uh, technology. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have people in the audience who um, are the experts um, on this, but, you know, I will say that uh, it's, you know, without a doubt, a home visit um, that is um, respectful and effective can lay a foundation um, for a more successful school year because there's greater um, trust that gets built mutually. Um, there's greater understanding and empathy um, that accrues um, from the visit from the perspective of the educator. Um, and, um, you know, there's a line of communication. There also can be some, you know, basic provision of information. I would say it's just incredibly um, striking. Um, and I think we can probably all think about this in our own lives in certain respects, it may not be with education because we have a lot of experts in that, but there, there are, areas for each of us where we don't feel so comfortable, uh, where we don't feel so familiar, we don't feel, um, you know, confident. And just getting some information uh, and reading it, it may not stick. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's also the case that this is an incredibly, um, even before COVID, um, you know, we're deluged. And I tell you, as a parent, it's hard to keep up. Um, and so just receiving emails, um, or perhaps an email and a text, you know, just does not suffice oftentimes if you're trying to ensure that, you know, parents follow through. And similarly with students, I heard an anecdote yesterday, David, talking to an administrator um, uh, from Phoenix Union uh, School District, which is a high school district. And um, she's just absolutely wonderful person, Thea Andrade. Um, and in the spring, Phoenix Union uh, had an every student every day uh, initiative where building on their advisories um, during the pandemic, they ensured that every educator um, or staff person, in her case, she's a chief academic officer, connected with students every day. Every student had an adult who was responsible for them. And she was, um, you know, struck by the fact that students, with all the information going out and repetition and reinforcement of information, still had questions for her. They yeah. always had questions. And I think, think that just underscores um, the need for human um, connection. Um, but, you know, it goes beyond information provision. It's really about the ability to discern 
you know, challenges um, and, you know, maybe prevent them. Um, mm. And it's just, it's just effective. It works. It's a departure from, um, you know, norms, but, you know, I think it's arguable for sure that it should be the new norm. Right. Yeah, I've noticed even with our own um, faculty colleagues, you know, as as we get closer to the school year, people have a heightened sense of anxiety about what their classrooms are going to look like, which students are going to show up and who's going to be remote. And um, we're encouraging the same kind of uh, um, behavior. We're, we're trying to get faculty to reach out to their students personally and kind of make that connection early. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to um, ask you, Jonah, to tell us about the Leadership Center at Stand for Children. And um, because it's a different kind of leadership center than I suspect people in an audience today are familiar with. And then whether, uh, so maybe tell us about that and then I have a follow-up question as it relates to communication. Sure, so we happen to be a, a family of organizations. So we have a 501c3, the Leadership Center, and a 501c4 that does our advocacy. And so the Leadership Center is really our, our vehicle uh, for um, you know, raising awareness and developing the leadership of parents and providing you know, support, um, including um, it, our Center for High School Success, um, which um, is focused on helping uh, school districts and high schools implement the ninth grade success approach that's been so successful in Chicago is part of our leadership center. Um, so it's, it's grown quite a bit because of the recognition that um, I shared earlier, David, that um, policy advocacy um, alone um, really isn't sufficient to achieving the progress with respect to greater equity um, that we seek. So in the, in the, in the um, case of COVID and the need to communicate, can districts or schools use lead, parent leaders as a way to um, uh, to do part of the communication to sort of bridge the perhaps um, historical divide between schools and and parents? Um, I'm thinking maybe uh, you know having parent groups send communication out to parents saying you can expect a phone call or you can expect a home visit. Um, through FaceTime or some other. And here's, here's what that might feel like to you. And here are some of the things we've experienced as we've done it. In other words, I'm just wondering if some parents would be a little more eager for that kind of virtual home visit if someone tells them that they've already done it. We've already had it happen to us. And here's what yeah. we thought about it. It's a great idea. Um, it's a great thought. I mean, I think the question would be in my mind of scale. Um, but certainly, you know, we are in the places that we work um, eager to play that role, um, as well as giving feedback um, around, you know, the types of um, outreach and activities and even more granular, um, you know, how to ask a question or um, how to frame something more simply. We've um, been very fortunate to, this is a, a tiny bit of a tangent, but I'll just say in that same genre, um, you know, I feel like just the principle, David, which I know you believe in, is that I want to involve people who are directly affected, um, you know, are the directly impacted folks um, to the greatest extent possible because, you know, in many cases, the people who are making decisions really don't know. Um, and, in, in, and we've been pleased to partner with Education Superhighway, um, which is a fantastic nonprofit um, that's made a huge difference in terms of broadband access and helping them design um, their toolkit for school districts um, so that they can get better survey responses from parents about connected device access. Districts have struggled a lot, um, mm -hmm. as you probably know, in getting accurate information uh, from parents. And so just doing the survey texting um, drill, you know, email text has gotten really low survey responses. And, um, you know, Education Superhighway has, has put out a toolkit, which I would encourage um, everyone, you know, who's attending to take a look at if you're if you work in a school district or have connections um, in order to uh, help school districts get more accurate information, which is so critical to enable school districts to know which students immediately need um, help um, with mm -hmm. being able to connect to remote learning. Very good. So I just want to remind audience members, send your questions as you as they pop up in your mind. Um, take a look at the document. That might stimulate some ideas for you to ask about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, motive, student motivation piece. I have a couple of questions there that, um, so, you know, I read the um, fair grading uh, policy um, 
with the light. And let, let me just tell you that I have a um, very strong predisposition to thinking that our system of grading in schools is, um, has always been problematic. And I think um, it's taken situations like this to show us just, um, you know, how um, perhaps um, anti educational they really are in many cases, right? Where um, grading becomes a way of penalizing children rather than thinking about how they can think of themselves as improving. Um, and so I, it was when I saw that part of the document that I thought, hmm, Stand for Children is actually doing something really interesting here. You're taking it, you're in a way taking the opportunity of talking about the crisis, but saying, by the way, here's where we believe grading policies should be um, considered or reconsidered. Um, and you've already touched on it a little bit, but um, it, it really is sort of, of a developmental idea, right? So that um, grading doesn't become, you know, this, this um, hammer that you continue to um, hit children with, but rather is a way for them to judge their um, growth and development within the content that you're teaching. And similarly, you've encouraged teachers to think about letting kids resubmit materials. And um, so say more about that. I, I'm, I, I'm happy to, I guess I've already told you what my opinion is about it. I, I think that's a fabulous stance and one that I think many um, veteran teachers in particular are not so comfortable with. And uh, I'd like to continue to advocate for that. Yeah, and, I, and I'd be curious, David, you know, as someone with such incredible expertise um, and experience, what, you know, your senses of um, why it is the way it is and or, and that might be just, you know, supposition, but, and then where it has changed, um, you know, what's, what's happened. Um, it seems, I understand, and I agree with your take on the sort of thrust that's punitive. Um, mm -hmm and rigid. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess it's one of those many things in the world where you think, gosh, the way things work, it doesn't make a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> you right. know, so I guess you could add it to a long list, but I'm just curious about, you know, your perspective. Yeah, I, I think we've often, perhaps always, used grading as a category, a, a way of categorizing children, putting them in, um, in uh, graduated boxes of competence. And, um, what I think grading often does is tells us more about ourselves as educators than it does about the children themselves. Now, you know, in certain circumstances in preparing um, high schoolers for the more challenging world of post-secondary uh, life, um, some of that is real. It's very real that tests are used to categorize. And, um, but even there, I think we're beginning to see sort of a breakdown in the system, right? These are systems that, um, have not always served children well, and particularly have not served um, marginalized groups very well, um, whether it's children with disabilities or um, children from low income communities. Um, we've just happily used the same system as though it was um, equitable. And in fact, what we knew, know is that it wasn't. And um, that's beginning to reveal itself, I think, more and more over time. What we haven't seen, however, is systems, um, uh, I think, taking a bold stand to sort of um, substitute it and, and look at things from a more developmental perspective. So um, we do have a question. Well, that's great. I want to reward question asking, so I'm going um, I'm to bring this up. But uh, the question is, what do you recommend for high school students with special accommodations? Um, this particular um, audience member has two sons with IEPs. Um, you know, so I'll take this one, Jonah, because um, special education is certainly my um, area of, of interest and expertise. But I think one of the most important things is that um, you're in communication with the school about those elements on the IEP that are of the highest priority to you and to your sons. And if they're high schoolers, um, in particular, your sons need to have an opinion about what's on that IEP and what is the most important thing. One thing we know that during this crisis, um, what we teach is going to be pushed into a smaller and smaller time slots. And um, 
this gives you an opportunity to engage um, your son and sons and their teachers around what are the most important things to attend to um, uh, on those IEPs and what could you let go if you had to because um, not everything can be of the highest importance. You're going to have to prioritize carefully. And so I would think prioritization, um, some of the things in the document um, about uh, daily advising, um, particularly for uh, students who are on IEPs, I think making sure they're, they're connected with their teachers and that they feel like there's um, both accountability on their part, but also that they're doing the things their teachers need them to do. It's got to be, they have to be met, right? The teacher can work hard, but if the students are also not um, uh, attending to the assignments and not doing the work, uh, that can be a problem. So that would be my, um, my, my general um, response to that. Let's talk a little bit about this idea that everyone should have an advisor and um, particularly in large high schools or large systems. How does one do that? Like, how do you think about, how are you um, promoting Jonah for families, uh, what they can expect from schools and how are you coaching school leaders on um, you know, how to make that happen. You know, let's say my children went to a public school in Texas with 3,200 kids. Um, I don't think any of my children met their high school advisors. That's just how. So how do you go about creating a situation where everyone has some level of advising or support from a school, school personnel? Um, you know, I think this is actually a wonderful opportunity for school districts to make a big stride. Um, in this direction. Um, when you're talking about, and I say, you know, the, in a re remote learning context, okay, so we're going to have various permutations here. But in a school um, setting that's totally remote, um, you know, essentially what we're asking is that, and this has happened, um, yeah, you know, for years and years and years, but just sort of sporadically, and it's not the norm, you know, we're asking that essentially educators and also um, support staff, um, and that's, a, by the way, a very complicated um, situation in terms of how, you know, your social and emotional um, support focused staff plug in in a remote context. Um, but, you know, you can assign, as Phoenix Union did last spring and as they're doing um, this school year, you know, an adult in the middle and high school context to a set of kids and have, you know, either some very either loose or tight, you know, it's a district decision um, protocol regarding the frequency of contact and the type of contact and the level of notation uh, and documentation. Um, but it's really, you know, actually not that complicated to assign. And the way Phoenix Union did it last spring was they had, um, as I said, every educator was assigned, in this case, 25 um, students. And then they also had other um, staff in schools that were kind of essentially on the educator's team. And so you could imagine, you know, a 10th grade, um, you know, history teacher, social studies um, and history teacher has their 25 students. It would either be their choice to check in with every student every day, or they could delegate, you know, some number of those students to, you know, support staff, the, um, you know, someone who works in the, the office or even on, you know, on the, uh, a coach, you know, or someone on, on, on uh, you know, on the support staff in the school. Uh, and then check in every day. And they're doing the same thing this fall. Um, and as I said, the superintendent of the district had uh, 10 kids, the chief academic officer had 10 kids. Um, and they're, you know, what they learned was that there's some kids who really, you know, wanted the support, needed the support daily. Um, there's some kids who said, you know, every other day is fine. Um, there's some kids who said, you know, once a week's okay. I'm really, you know, good. Uh, and so they're modifying it this fall. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it begs the question, uh, David, as to why we wouldn't want to do that. Um, as the norm. Um, I think, you know, what, what was really striking to me was both how um, much impact it had in terms of enabling, preventing students from getting, um, you know, falling through the cracks, you know, knowing um, sooner about basic needs. The food um, distribution on the part of Phoenix Union really was phenomenal, um, you know, as an example. And they have elementary districts feeding into them. Um, but, you know, there was both in terms of device distribution and food distribution, I think they really shined. Um, mm -hmm. because they had that direct contact and they could hear needs. Uh, and then the ability to just kind of provide that kind of um, critical motivation um, and support and, you know, listening ear, um, you know, and, and also make referrals when needed. 
uh, when kids need a social worker, when kids need a counselor. Mm -hmm. um, it makes a ton of sense, um, you know, as in, for a lot of reasons, let's put it this way. And the adults liked it. Right. You know, the adults liked who it. Who doesn't like a relationship? I mean, we... Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a lot of adults who are adult-facing, there may be specialists or folks who mm -hmm. just are instructional coaches or whatever. It's nice for them to get to interact directly with kids as well. So I would hope this becomes a new norm. Now, in the, in the setting that's in school, it's a little more challenging because we're talking about advisory periods. And that's, you know, not, in, not trivial. Um, to figure out and, and, you know, dealing with, um, you know, work rules and such and fair compensation. Um, but, you know, again, many districts have tackled that um, successfully in terms of advisories. But I would just say that, you know, whether it's remote or not, you could still have this um, orientation toward checking in with students individually. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really think it's more about, a, about will um, than skill. Um, and the guidance that we put down, which is drawn directly from Phoenix Union, I think, really suffices for anyone, you know, who runs a school or, and has certain autonomy or school district who has a certain uh, level of motivation around this to implement. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I want to, um, somebody in the Q&A mentioned in relation to the last um, uh, question related to IEPs, um, that they need to make sure they're advocating hard for um, all of the tools and equipment that their children need in order to address the um, learning goals of the IEP. And in some cases, I think parents may feel um, perhaps a bit sheepish about asking for things, but this is not the time to, to feel that way, right? I think in many cases, if, you're, if you have children on IEPs, making sure you're talking to the school about ensuring you get the equipment you need at home so that they can benefit from any kind of um, access that specialists are providing, uh, even virtually, that that will be um, absolutely essential for them to make progress. Then there are two questions that have come up that I'm, um, uh, are very troubling to me, and I think many people um, would agree. And this is, you know, the series of webinars we're doing are on social justice and equity. So one of the things we're noticing, and one qu question comes up about sort of the have and have not educational divide, and you sort of address this with the education superhighway, but maybe you've got a little bit more you can um, say about this, but how do we, how do we ensure that we find those um, parents? And um, in the Boston Public Schools, I've heard administrators say where there were strong leaders in schools, they already had the relationships with families and they knew where the pockets of um, families were that were going to have least access and they knew how to target support. Um, but not every school had a strong leader. Not every school had leaders that were in the school for many years. And so they didn't know the community as well. Um, I think that's been one of the interesting things that's been revealed by this crisis is that um, you know, school districts often move leadership around. And one of the things we don't think about is the relationship those leaders build with the community in that school. And I think that only sort of exacerbates the problem of not knowing where the um, where the families are who need the support the most. But let me add to that a second question, which is um, that many families with means are now saying, we're not sending our kids back to school. We're going to create our own school, kind of a pod of children in the community. And we're gonna hire professionals to come in and teach those kids, almost like a one room schoolhouse kind of model, which, yeah, you know, uh, I, um, I understand the approach and I kind of um, appreciate what they're trying to do, but I also think this just sort of magnifies the problem, right? That we're not going to, um, we're not going to, uh, that, that's not going to happen equitably, right? People who can afford to pay um, for essentially private tutors to, to teach in community pods. So, I guess I, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about poverty and its intersection with, with these issues, um, Jonah, if you wouldn't mind. So how much time do we have left? <laughs> yeah, um, three minutes, but it's good. No, look, look, um, number one, on the first question, this is, this is let's, not, let's not, you know, sugarcoat it. Um, this is a terrible, terrible crisis. Um, it's a public health crisis. And the people who are suffering the most 
are you know black and brown uh, and poor and the same is i mean that's true in terms of who's dying that's true in terms of who's um, getting more seriously ill and um, that's true in terms of who's facing the most dire economic um, damage so let's not let's not sugarcoat it and then you know the educational aspect of it is just another extension we have a fundamental long-standing problem of inequity which is racially based and racism driven in this country and so you know with respect to this school year ahead um, the best things that can be done are mitigation and so educators I know, having talked to many, are working incredibly hard under very, very difficult circumstances to do their very best. And you know, certainly there, there is a, um, there's an amplitude of responses. There are some school districts that are, like, as you said, or schools that you know, just are doing a better job in terms of um, already providing connected devices um, and you know, knowing who needs them, getting them, provisioning them, distributing them, and then some have not done well. And that's, you know, we have a very, very decentralized education system in this country. And so there's gonna be massive variability and that's, you know, that's a challenge. Um, so what I'd say on the, on the device access, cause it's so fundamental um, and just wanna give a few clear um, prescriptions there to the attendees. One is state departments of education can require that districts report on connected device access and education superhighway um, has a, a set of guidelines and they've got um, several states already opting in. And so if anyone happens to, you know, have that level of relationship, you can encourage your state uh, chief, your state superintendent to, uh, or state board of education to adopt a resolution that would require districts to report. And you want that to be regular. You want that to be worded clearly so that there's transparency about this. This is make or break. This is whether kids can attend school or not. This is the same situation as you know in pre-1974 um you know before you know my mother and many others stood up and you know got the uh the the sort of uh, federal order in place requiring that um children with special needs be educated before that they were home this is you know this is black and white yeah. so there's that uh, and then also in terms of districts you know there can be a lot of advocacy um to keep this front and center and really in, you know a very um, strenuous push um understanding the challenges, but, you know, you know, making sure that people's feet are, are held to the fire. More broadly, though, um, you know, there's no ability to separate inequity from educational inequity, injustice from educational um, injustice. And so, you know, anybody who cares about educational um, equity needs to care about social justice. Yeah. You know, anyone who cares about you know, all children achieving at high levels or, or, you know, closing opportunity gaps needs to care about racial justice. Um, and, you know, we have a fundamentally unjust system, starting with property tax funding. Um, you know, we're one of the few countries in the world that provides less funding for children who have greater needs than we do for children who are privileged. Just let that sit with you for a second. You know, there's only a handful of countries that are so upside down with that respect, from that respect. Um, you know, and then, you know, on and on and on in terms of residential segregation and the effects on, on children um, and the, um, you know, unequal, unequal distribution of both, you know, um, funds and um, human capital. Um, and, um, you know, I think we all have to really be willing to be intersectional, to go beyond education, to not see, um, you know, um, criminal justice reform or living wages or um, affordable housing as someone else's issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think um, we're seeing uh, this was pre-COVID, but we've seen mayors across the country beginning to look at um, how cities could be held accountable for child poverty, right? And what are the factors that, the levers that lead to child poverty? And schools are um, oftentimes both um, the lever, but also they are the ones who have to deal with the consequences of um, 
these these uh, huge inequities that you describe. I think that's absolutely right. There are a couple yeah. of com comments in the Q and A I want to um, draw out. One in particular was about your comments about restructuring schools to advise um, and and support families, and and uh, Rochelle made the point that in. Um, in, for young children, you know, there may be ways to reassign or to assign a support function to personnel in the school district um, to reach out to families and make sure that uh, maybe they've never had that function before, but, um, you know, really redeploy people in different ways to, to support families that perhaps in the past they've never had to do that. But as you mentioned, it might be a um, really nice opportunity for a school district to think differently about the way they support, not just older students in advising, but, um, but young children and the families who are trying to help them. Yeah, um, I would say that I, I strongly agree with that. And um, this goes back to the expectation potentially that could be um, you know, universal that elementary school teachers um, have virtual home visits with each one of their students. And that's not to say that um, there couldn't be supplementation in certain cases of a large class or, you know, a teacher who has um, some mitigating circumstance to be part of that. But in the elementary context, I think it, it'd be even, you know, easier just based on the, the, the way in which it's structured um, yeah. to assign, you know, um, adults to connect up front and then on an ongoing basis with kids. Um, there was also one comment, David, um, that really resonated um, back to your excellent points that you were making about grading. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not to dwell too much on it, but um, <laughs> I saw directly, and I mentioned this before, that um, my kids, you know, and many other of, of their peers did the minimum um, because it was pass fail. And they knew at the end, we literally had a, you know, one of those parent adolescent <laughs> dynamics where we're trying to get our kids to you know adhere to the larger value of following through and doing your best and you know and also showing respect for their teachers by completing assignments and I mean literally you just can't make a certain and you know you could threaten and punish and this and that and the other but there's a relational cost to that um, but you know I think the reality is is we need and this is why in our grading practices um, Ms. Clark if you want to take a look at it um, who asked the question you know I think you need ABC you know, we could have a larger debate on grades and boy, it'd be great if, you know, everyone became internally driven and motivated. Um, but, you know, that's for, you know, another day, I think, and, and another time. Right now, kids have been socialized. And so to the extent that there is a group of kids who would do a lot more, work a lot harder, do a lot better, turn their stuff in sooner, make it easier on their teachers, um, show up more, mm -hmm. uh, participate more um, by there being an A, Bs, and Cs. That's why we should have A, Bs, and Cs. Yeah. And there should be rigor. Um, at the same time, for kids who, you know, there are more challenges, um, there are more barriers, why would we want to penalize them by having some sort of strict, uncompromising um, orientation, um, you know, zero tolerance in the sense, we're going to teach you a lesson by failing you, which only teaches the lesson either of, you know, that I'm a failure or that the adults don't care about me really, or the system's rigged against me, um, which is not the lesson we want people to learn in life. And so I think you can strike a balance. Yeah, I think I think um, to that point, it, 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 you would be hard pressed to find any evidence that either Jonah or I don't ap approve of accountability. I mean, we really both have been advocates for that in the past publicly. I think I think the point we're trying to make is that um, in a developmental per, from a developmental perspective, you want to give children both the sense that this will count, right? There will be a grade, um, but in the meantime, the harder you work toward your own improvement, the, that's how you're going to move that grade, right? It's not going to be by teacher fiat or, um, so the idea is really to encourage engagement, I think, using, using a fair grading policy. That's right. Um, oh, I see an old friend, um, Ranjani on the, on the call, but um, she, she points out in addition to considering changes to grading, what recommendations do you have for attendance policies during this remote learning? Um, situation. Are, have you all talked about that? At, at we have. I mean, I think in general, there needs to be um, uh, similarly, you know, encouragement and motivation to attend, and there needs to be tracking, uh, and there needs to be um, through this advising or and or grade level meetings of staff, prompt outreach to students who are not attending. 
you know, so I, I think it's both and. It's yeah. both, you know, some incentivizing and then really quick intervening when kids are not just paid. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about another really practical element within the document um, on uh, social and emotional learning and that I was just delighted by and I want to make sure people um, see it and that we call attention to it. So there is a link in the document that takes people to um, specific lesson plans on social emotional learning, like how to help um, teach kindness and a number of things, but they, but I, what I loved about them, Jonah, is that um, you all drew from these um, ideas that you've got to, uh, if if you want kids to learn to be a, to to um, engage with each other in a certain way, you have to teach that behavior has to be taught, right? It's not um, we can't just expect it to happen. And um, who, I mean, what was the genesis of that? And are these social, are there more lessons like that that people can have access to besides the ones that were um, linked to the document? I'm glad you're highlighting this, David. Um, yes, a few years ago, um, seeing the, you know, the burgeoning hate in our society and unfortunately in our schools, we set out to um, see if we can make a difference and noted tremendous uh, content out there, um, you know, in your city, Facing History and ourselves has been doing fantastic work for 40 years. Um, Harvard's Making Caring Common Initiative, Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, Berkeley, Berkeley um, has a, um, uh, you know, an, an outfit. Um, there are many others. And, but what we notice is that there's actually, you know, really wanting distribution. And so the content, um, you know, was there. Um, and, you know, there's obviously second step is quite scaled and there's some really good stuff out there. But as you'll note, and I bet educators you are attending would note, you know, there's also sort of an explosion. It's not really clear what's good and what's not. And um, so we reached out to the leading providers and we were so gratified that they were willing to provide, um, you know, free of charge, um, you know, and the only requirement was attribution, any lesson um, that we wanted to curate. And we were looking for lessons that we felt could be taught in a one class period or part of class period, didn't require any professional development in order to be um, as easily adopted and created something called the um, Teach Kindness Challenge, um, which enables schools to sign up if they can get 40% um, of their teachers on board and provide those teachers with a wonderful online platform. Um, and they can choose from 32 um, lessons. We added, um, online kindness, um, actually subsequently, because we heard so much about, you know, terrible um, things happening on social media. So this is spread to hundreds of schools every year. But during the pandemic, um, we're really, you know, real, we're realizing that schools can't do another thing. Um, so we're kind of taking the requirements out of it um, and just providing the lessons um, and adapting as many lessons as we can, because, you know, some of them are really geared toward in-person type things, um, but the ones that can be done virtually, um, we're adapting and uh, putting out, um, you know, at no cost. And so hopefully that can be a resource that folks in the call um, can benefit from and you can let others, others know about. Um, so teach kindness. That's great. As an aside, I think um, all of us have been living now for months in isolation. I find myself going to the grocery store and I don't talk to anyone. It's sort of like we've, uh, we've, equated physical distancing with not talking to each other, not engaging with one another. And I think um, to the extent that schools can do things like teach kindness or, um, and some of this is directly related to some of the bigger challenges we're seeing nationally around anti-racism and te teaching tolerance is another resource that a lot of people have right. leaned into, which um, you know, starts particularly at the early ages around um, teaching kindness. There are a number of questions. Many of you are asking some great questions. I'm, I'm going to try to get to all of them, but someone asks a very um, pointed question, and I want to be sure. Um, they said your every student every day concept is very concrete and very um, uh, important given the immediacy of the school year coming up. What else is in the document, Jonah, that you would say pay attention to this, right? This, this particular thing, concrete, we're hearing people respond to it. Is there some, anything like that that you'd wanna draw our attention to? Yeah, well, so I wanna credit Phoenix Union High School District, Chad Geston, 
uh, and Thea Andrade with every student every day. Um, but you know, I think we're smart enough to realize that it was incredibly effective. Yeah. Um, the, the grading practices, without a doubt, um, it's you know, you, it, it's doable um, and it makes sense. It's drawn on lots of research and practice and common sense. We see some good comments from folks uh, in the Q and A um, about their experience with allowing do overs. Um, and you know, I would say it takes um, a little bit more effort, but um, and so the virtual home visits as well. Um, again, like if you allocate a certain block of time, why would, you know, and, and this can be done, why would you not want to ensure that there is systematic communication by a classroom teacher in the elementary context or, you know, some uh, caring adult in the middle and high school context with every student? And to the extent that you can't get in touch, that indicates an issue potentially with connected device access that you'd want to know about right away. So I just say that's another one where, um, you know, to the greatest extent possible, um, would, would encourage that. Um, you know, another one is really more, um, a, it's something that I think every school district and grade level can do, which is essentially, you know, an early warning and intervention system. So we talked mm -hmm. about how the advising is that. It's other things as well. It's a bridge. It's an opportunity to provide more support. It's a way of boosting students up. You know, but um, why shouldn't every other week staff and um, educators in a particular grade get together and based on, you know, what's apparent in the data, kids that are not attending or kids that have behavioral challenges or kids who are failing, um, you know, certain quizzes or, you know, at risk of failing a course and then intervening quickly and then looking at trends. It works, it works. It, you know, we've seen that in Chicago with ninth grade um, work. It makes such a huge difference and it really should be the norm. Obviously, um, Bob, Bob Belfans has been um, advocating for this for decades and um, you know, what an incredible person and incredible uh, resource everyone graduates it. Um, but I'd say, you know, again, this is one of those things that we, if we step back and look at the pandemic school year, but just schooling in general, um, you know, this can and should become a norm in terms of the release time for teachers to uh, get together with staff and, you know, figure out which kids are potentially um, struggling and or which kids could be doing better, um, mm -hmm. could be getting Bs, uh, and they're not. Um, so those would be some of them. Um, I want to point to a resource for the question regarding standards-based learning. Um, and I don't have a link um, in my head, but Student Achievement Partners has put out um, some good resources with regard to rigor. Um, and we haven't talked about this, David, but we don't want a year of pure remediation. Right. It, that, you know, that would be a disaster. And, you know, let's, let's, you know, be honest about which kids potentially are most at risk of, of that orientation. Um, and right. so I think that's a great question um, by the attendee and hopefully student achievement partners can help in terms of, you know, that the, the type of blend of, um, you know, catch up with high expectations in terms of curriculum. Yeah, we've had some conversations with um, academic leadership at uh, Boston Public Schools about this very issue. And it's not just children who are the most vulnerable, but prioritizing the standards that are most important um, in a particular grade level, knowing that um, time and access is going to be different for everyone and um, looking for ways to, um, you know, make, set those priorities, um, identify those standards that are most important, and then really working hard to ensure that everybody gets access to those. Yeah. Um, maybe time for um, one more question. You mentioned, I want to make sure you've dropped a couple of other important connections. Um, Bob Belfans at Johns Hopkins University, who's uh, been working on um, preventing school dropout for many, many, many years. And if you Google Bob, um, B-A-L-F-A-N-Z, um, you'll find a you know, treasures there of things and resources to draw on. Um, uh, yeah, let me just see if there's anything we've, if you um, have access to the Q&A, you might see some responses to people. Um, I don't know if only panelists can see those, but we'll, we'll try to make um, any resources that people have listed in there available to you. One yeah. question someone raised is, is does STAND have a, a thought or a um, position on whether or not state um, assessments should be used? We know that 
Uh, many, if not all states, canceled their end of year assessments in the spring. That changes a lot of things, as you know, um, because we've created a system now that sort of revolves around them. Um, but what are your thoughts about that, Joan? Oh, I think we're, you know, that is the last thing that, um, you know, we should be focused on um, at this moment. Um, I think, you know, the key is to assess kids coming in and figure out where they are uh, and then to, you know, calibrate um, support and instruction and then, you know, get past remediation as soon as possible. Um, yeah. I think the, the conversation should be much more right now about formative and interim um, assessments. And, um, you know, we can't just, um, you know, agree, we can't just kind of give up. Um, I just go back to where we started. This is an incredibly challenging situation. Yes. It's not a normal school year. This is a once in a century, we hope, um, situation. That's and right. it really is about mitigating harm. Um, and, you know, there may be some benefits in this for sure um, for some kids, but it's just a very terrible situation for, for many, if not most. And so the question is really um, how to make the best of it. Um, and it's really not about holding, you know, educators or anyone in schools or whatever accountable in these debates, um, which are worth having. Um, but really, this is about how to do the best possible um, job of educating and supporting um, and healing uh, kids. And so I think you know, this is an opportunity to really put relationships at the forefront. Um, it's really an opportunity to step back and look at um, things that we can do differently, um, that are doable, that would make a difference, and perhaps continue doing. It's also a moment, and I you know, just want to add this at the end here, where you know, folks can really, um, I think, improve and really um, get to a different place with regard to their own um, commitment to anti-racism, mm -hmm. you know, their own commitment to rooting out biases, to um, dismantling you know, the, the, the myths and the misperceptions and the contortions and distortions that we all are raised with by growing up in this racist society uh, and just doing better. And it's a journey. It's not, it's, you know, it's not like you're just going to get there. It's an ongoing um, journey. But making strides in that journey that are concerted, um, I think right now, is also a huge opportunity. So let me um, conclude today by thanking our audience for um, joining us and have the, and the great questions you've been asking. I also um, want to express my gratitude to you, Jonah, for joining us and um, making yourself available, but also for the great work that Stand um, does every day and has done for uh, 20 years. I, 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 would, um, I was asked to do a little um, video interview about what we can expect education to look like post COVID. And my feeling is, is that we need to expect more of ourselves. And, and that's not a, about any one of us, but um, we've built a system that, as you mentioned, is highly inequitable. And here's a chance for us. I think we've got, we're gonna have more than a year at least to really rethink um, what was our motivation for what we've done and what has it caused, what have been some of the unintended consequences and some, in some cases the intended consequences of things like statewide assessments and should they be done differently? Should they focus on different um, things? Should we set different standards? Should we prioritize standards? Should we, um, uh, should we should should we have standards for how you build relationships, for example, as opposed to um, perhaps purely academic standards? I think we have a lot of work to do, and and um, I want to uh, ask everyone to remain safe and healthy. And um, there's still so much more um, for us to talk about and learn. And uh, more webinars will be coming forward. And I want to thank um, Mary Ellen Medayo and our team at um, BU Wheelock for helping us put this together. So Jonah, thank you again for your participation and good luck with everything. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Take care. That was great, Jonah. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was a lot of fun. Be well. Yeah, Report you too. Take care of yourself, okay? You too. Wonderful to see you and work with you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.